Good morning and welcome to Church of the Palms. We're so glad you found your way to us today. The Church of the Palms, our mission is to love God and love neighbor, which Jesus said were the two greatest commandments. Our prayer is that these two commands guide everything that we do, our worship, our life together, and our service to the community near and far. This morning's service is our sanctuary worship service. Lyrics to the hymns will be on your screen, as well as scripture texts when the message has begun. You can also access our bulletin on churchofthepalms.org right on our home page. For those who enjoy worshiping in a more contemporary fashion, there is a contemporary service held on campus. Whichever way you like to worship, we hope you can share the opportunity with friends and family who might be searching for a church home. If you'd like more information about any of the announcements mentioned in today's service, feel free to give our office a call or visit us online. Our website is also a great way to learn more about our mission to love God and love neighbor and all about our small groups, classes, and community outreach efforts, some of which you can attend online. If you'd like to financially support Church of the Palms, there are several ways you can support our mission to love God and love neighbor. One of the easiest is online giving, the options of which you will find posted later in the service. We're so glad you chose to join us this morning. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Church of the Palms. My name is Steve Rao and I serve as an elder in our congregation. Let us now prepare our hearts for worship as we bow our heads for the prayer of invocation. Come to stay with us, O risen Christ. We will try not to be startled or terrified when you make yourself known. Grant your transforming peace to this assembly of your people that we may listen to learn and understand, not to take issue and find fault. We want to celebrate with you, to hear your teaching with sharper clarity, to be strengthened for service in ways that challenge and stretch us. This is the hour for which we have waited. Keep us from worship that is merely routine. Amen. Let us praise God through our worship.
Please stand for call to worship found on page number three of your bulletin. Tremble, O earth, in the presence of your God. It is an awesome thing to be surprised by God. We are invited to the mountains of a feast. We are lifted up to see the bounty of the earth. Let us be glad together, rejoicing in salvation. Let us meet one another with sincerity and truth. Let us not be strangers to one another. God calls us into the family of faith. Let us worship God. Remain standing as we enter this time of confession. Psalm 51 states, Create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and put a new and right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Let us enter into a time of prayer. Let us pray the prayer of confession together. Your church is less than faithful, righteous God. We want to represent our risen Savior, but we forget that Jesus loved the unlovable, forgave the unforgivable, and welcomed sinners. We set limits on inclusiveness and break bread only with those who qualify to sit at the table with us. We do not recognize your presence in people who seem different from us. 
Seldom is there passion for discipleship among us. Forgive us and renew your church, O God. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us continue our confession in silence. Amen. Psalm 103. As far as the east is from the west, so far has the Lord removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father loves their children, so the Lord loves those who honor and worship God. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Remain standing as we affirm what we believe by stating the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now we come to a time of the passing of the peace, and I'd invite the children to come forward at this moment for the children's moment. Now may the peace of Christ be with you. morning. Did you guys have breakfast this morning? <laughs> Does someone want to tell me what they have for breakfast? Yeah. One sec. Let me grab a mic for you. What do you have for breakfast? Pancakes and waffles. That's amazing. You can't go wrong with that. How about you? Lunch. Lunch? Lunch for breakfast? That's a new one. 
How much is that? Um, eggs. Eggs? Eggs are always good. Yeah? A turkey sandwich. Turkey sandwich? Close to the lunch. Waffles. Waffles? I don't matter waffles this morning. Crackers. Crackers. Oh, we got one more? What'd you have? Cereal? Cereal? Yeah, cereal is always a classic. So today I have a story I want to share with you all. Is that okay? This is a true story. It really happened, and it was, it was written in the Bible. It was about these two travelers, these two weary travelers, and they were on a road to a place called Emmaus. And they were friends of Jesus, and they were very sad. They were very sad because Jesus was just buried. This was only a few days ago after he was crucified, and so nobody had seen Jesus, nobody had heard of him. And as they were walking along this road, they came across a stranger. What are you two talking about? We lost our friend Jesus. He died, and we don't know if he's coming back. These two strangers continued talking, and and they were remembering about the good times that they had with Jesus. Does anyone want to share what they know about Jesus or what they remember? Yeah, Grant? That he got killed on the cross. That's true. That's very true. Yeah. He forgives everyone. He does forgive everyone. Yeah? Um, he had to carry the cross. He did have to carry the cross. It's very true. And this all happened pretty recently. We just had a holiday to, uh, to remember it. Does anyone remember? Yeah? Easter. Yes, indeed. So as these two strangers, or as the two travelers and the stranger continue walking, they felt warm and fuzzy around the stranger, almost as if you were holding the teddy bear. And they, they finally continued walking until they reached their home. And as they reached their home, the two travelers invited the stranger in to eat with them. So they came, and they sat at a table together. And remember, they've been traveling a lot, so they're super, super hungry. Now, as the two travelers and the stranger sat down together, the stranger picked up the piece of bread. He lifted it up and gave thanks to God and broke it and giving it to his friends. Does anyone know who the stranger might be? Yeah. Jesus. That is right. So the stranger turned out to be Jesus the whole time. And so what does this mean? The, the stranger who the two travelers didn't know was Jesus. And the entire time, Jesus was walking with the stranger. And so just the way Jesus has been with the two travelers this entire time, Jesus is with us. He's with you, he's with me, and he's with everyone else in this room. And so that's a reminder for us that no matter where we go and whether we see him or we don't see him, Jesus is with us. Would you guys like to pray with me? Yeah? All right, you guys can repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God you go before us. You go before us. You are always with us. You are always with us. You never leave us. You never leave us. Nor forsake us. Nor forsake us. So we will not be afraid. So we will not be afraid. And we will not be discouraged. We will not be discouraged. Amen. 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 All righty. Do you want to follow in this carol? Good morning. 
Welcome to Church of the Palms. That was Morgan Wilson who led our children's moment. Morgan is an intern with us uh, over the course of the spring season and is uh, learning about the church and discovering maybe perhaps if I have anything to say about it, that he's being called to the ministry, but that's another point. But we're so glad that Morgan was here, and we are grateful that you are here uh, on this, this uh, day of the Lord as we gather together in the season of Easter, and we hope that you will find this to be a great place of welcome and that you'll find a way by which you can connect. Speaking of connect, after the service, we invite you to come out underneath the tree, and in your bulletin, there are these things called Connect Cards. I believe you got a Connect Card there, and that's a way for you to uh, connect with other people underneath the tree, and you ask them certain questions, and uh, once you get all the answers done, you can turn the card in for a raffle. Yes, Presbyterians every once in a while do a raffle. <laughs> and the winner of the raffle gets lunch with Genevieve Beauchamp and Jonathan Spivey. So how, boy, you've got to come out for this. I mean, I mean, holy smokes, that's going to be a great, great event. I hope I win, actually. Um, so come and join us for that. Lots of other things going on. Next week, we re-engage our Gather and Grow series, and it will be Embrace, Embracing Change and Transition, a toolkit for aging faithfully. You might want to really think about this next Sunday at 10 o'clock or 1015 over in the Campus Center. Join us for that. We are uh, looking forward to, in a few weeks, uh, celebrating the class of 2024, the high school class of 2024. And uh, Connor Peters, our director of family ministry, would love for you if you have a class of 2024 high school student in your family uh, and wish for them to be recognized during that service, to contact Connor Peters on, by May the 1st for our Sunday of celebration on May the 12th. So hope you'll do that. We have a new members class next Sunday. So if you'd like to learn more about life here at Church of the Palms, you'll meet with Dr. Brown uh, next Sunday at 1015 in the chapel. Our senior well-being ministry is looking forward to sponsoring a brain power class. Brain power class. I feel the power coming from all of your brains, even as we speak. But a wonderful opportunity for you to learn about how you can continue to keep your brain engaged, and that will be on April the 17th at 3 p.m. So hope you'll join us for that. Our men's retreat is coming up this Saturday. It's going to be a great event over at Day Spring up in Ellington, Florida. Uh, it will be a wonderful day. There's still chances for you to sign up. If you'd like to learn more about that, uh, look at your bulletin as well as find some uh, sign-up sheets underneath the tree uh, after our service today. We look forward to uh, welcoming David French, who will be here this coming Thursday, this coming Thursday evening here in the sanctuary. David French is a opinion columnist, uh, a devout Christian, a, a Iraqi war veteran, and uh, he has some great and encouraging things for us to think about when we think about our life, not only in the church, but also our life in the public square. So hope you'll join us for that. David French, 6.30 here in the sanctuary. This is the final uh, speaker in our Faith and Society speaker series. It is my joy to welcome Dr. James Annabelli, who is the president of Eckerd College. Uh, Jim and his wife, Anna, who I believe is right there. Wave your hand there, Anna. Thank you very much. Uh, Jim has been a friend of mine for uh, quite a while, ever since I came to Church of the Palms. He has been at uh, Eckert, Eckert College for the last 34 years. He's touched pretty much every part of that campus, and as I said just earlier, they finally got the sense to appoint him president. And so uh, he has, uh, he's now serving as president of Eckert College. Eckert is uh, the only Presbyterian college in Florida, and it has a wonderful, wonderful reputation. I've been uh, I've enjoyed my opportunity to engage with that college, especially on their, um, on their church relations committee. And it has been a joy to uh, learn about all the many ways that they integrate higher education and uh, the Christian faith. And so we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Annarelli here, and uh, we will be uh, having him underneath the tree after the service for you to greet him uh, and to welcome him to our, our campus. Would you please welcome him now, please? Thank you. A couple of service notes. We're trying something different today. We are actually going to be beaming Dr. Annarelli over to the Campus Center. 
Uh, so they will get to watch him on screen while he preaches here. But in order to do that, we had to kind of rearrange our service. I know Presbyterians don't like the service rearranged, <laughs> um, but go with us for at least this Sunday, please. Um, we will be, uh, Dr. Anna really will be preaching a little bit earlier in the service so that we can ensure that his message is connecting in with the service over there. This is sort of a, a little experiment, so go with us on that. Also, uh, we will uh, encourage you to take a look at page 10 in your bulletin, which is the second hymn that we'll be singing in a very short while. Uh, Thine is the glory, one of the, great, one of the great Easter hymns. But it's got a little trick in it. And so if you go down to the one, two, three, fourth line down at the bottom there, where it says, refrain last time only. Do you see that? Uh, I don't sure. Uh, <clears throat> what, that's the point at which when you get through the first verse, you go right back up to the top and you begin to sing the second verse. And then you come down to the end of the second verse where it says death has lost its thing. You go right back up and sing the third verse. And then finally at the end, you sing the refrain that you've been waiting to sing uh, all throughout the hymn, Thine is the glory, risen, conquering son. I know I've probably confused you more than I've helped you, but just uh, be looking for that uh, in, um, in our second hymn. Now I'd like to invite Marlene Petro to come forward. Marlene has been for years the coordinator of a very important uh, day in the life of Church of the Palms, a day of hope, and she would love to have you learn about that and encourage you to be a part of it. I'd like for you to mark your calendars this morning for Saturday, July 20th. That's our lucky 13th year for Day of Hope at Church of the Palms. Can you believe we have been doing this program for 13 years, helping children in our neighborhood get ready for the start of school. Let me read to you what Susan Nations, the <clears throat> principal of Wilkinson School, wrote about Day of Hope and how it affects her kids at Wilkinson. Day of Hope is such a game changer for our kids and their families. When a family is pinched due to the rising cost of clothing, school supplies, and other expenses, it's not uncommon for them to feel deflated and incapable. There's no worse feeling than that of a parent who wants to meet their child's needs, but cannot. The current trend is these $45 Stanley Cups. And although out of reach for most Wilkinson families, some children do have them. Picture the crying child, ridiculed, because hers doesn't have the right logo. This is not a suggestion that we get all kids Stanley Cups, Susan writes, no, not at all. <clears throat> it's just the very real comparison game that takes place regularly, especially at the beginning of the school year when some students have new clothes, new shoes, new everything, and some do not. Day of Hope help fills the gap and ensures that everyone has something shiny and new for back to school. And beyond that, she writes, it is a day that loves and serves our students and families so well, it matters. Once again, serving 250 neighborhood needy children is our goal. And once again, we must raise at least $25,000 in order to do that. There are ways, many ways in which you can donate. But this year, we have the 2024 Giving Challenge, sponsored by uh, the Community Foundation. And that's going to take place on Tuesday, April 9th, from noon until noon on Wednesday, April 10th. This is an opportunity to give to multiple nonprofits, but Day of Hope at Church of the Palms is certainly one of them, and we hope you'll consider that. Your donation of up to $100 will be matched by the Patterson Foundation, and we'll be able to reach our goal twice as fast. 
Information on the Giving Challenge uh, link is in your bulletin on page 13. You'll also be receiving an email from the church on Tuesday morning with that link. So all you have to do is click the button, have your credit card ready, and donate. We hope you'll help us make our 13th year the luckiest and most blessed for the children that we serve with shiny and new backpacks, gift cards, haircuts, medical checks, plus a whole lot more. Your past generosity tells me that you'll do just that. So for those of you who don't know about the Giving Challenge or who don't know about Day of Hope, Marsha, and Kyle Quattlebaum and I will be under the tree between services, and we'd be more than happy to talk to you. Thank you. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel according to Luke, the 24th chapter, beginning at the 13th verse. Hear the word of God. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? 
And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, the, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. Uh, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but they did not see him. And then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself and all the scriptures. And as they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? And that same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together, and they were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Come, O Holy Spirit, fill our hearts with the power of your love. Send forth your wisdom, O Lord. Amen. Good morning. I am absolutely thrilled to be with you this morning and very grateful to my friend Steve for the kind invitation to join you on this, the second Sunday of Easter. Now in an attempt to keep our fervor about the resurrection of our Lord at its highest point, I'd like to invite you to participate in a dialogic version of the ancient Paschal greeting. Christus Anesti, Christ is risen, to which we respond, he is risen indeed. Let's try it. So everyone to my left, Christ is risen. Everyone to my right, he is risen indeed. There isn't a whole lot of fervor in that. <laughs> Can we try it one more time? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. This morning's gospel reading, an account that is unique to Luke's gospel is my favorite post-resurrection gospel story. And this is so for a number of reasons. First, it reflects the Lucan journey motif found in multiple places, 
both in the Gospel of Luke and in the book of Acts. And as we know, the metaphor of a journey was and remains a powerful one for expressing both the nature of the Christian life of faith and the missionary nature of the church. The story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus also encapsulates the movement, the process, the journey, if you will, by which the seeming defeat by the cross is supplanted by a triumphant faith in the resurrection. In the beginning of the account, the two disciples are sad, indeed despondent. Luke tells us, they stood still, looking sad. And after recounting the events of the past few days to the unrecognized risen Jesus, they added with disappointment, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. But through God's grace, mediated by the transformative interaction with the risen Christ in their midst, they traveled the journey from despondency to the joyful, charismatic proclamation that the Lord has risen. Finally, for me, the story encapsulates the challenge that is set before us every day as an Easter people. Put simply, that is the challenge of recognizing the risen Christ in our midst. Luke 24, 31, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. The context is clear. Two disciples unknowingly encounter the risen Jesus on the road to Emmaus, and as verse 31 relates, their eyes were opened to Jesus in their midst through the breaking of the bread. Now, I was raised in the highly sacramental Roman Catholic tradition and always has, have found particularly meaningful the manner in which this story reflects a Eucharistic allusion. While this Eucharistic element is an important, indeed central dimension of Luke's walk to Emmaus account, I want to focus this morning on the broader challenge posed by this gospel account. This challenge may be expressed in the form of a question. What are the truly eye-opening experiences, people, activities, and events that yield a recognition of God's presence in our lives, that lead to a recognition of the risen Jesus in our midst? I think that in our faith lives, it is very easy to slip into a tendency toward compartmentalization, to more readily see manifestations of God in explicitly religious contexts, in the context of liturgy and worship, for example. I certainly have experienced that temptation to look primarily to the sanctuary to God's holy word, and to formal worship and the sacraments. But I like to think that a central theme of my own faith life might be expressed in terms of what might be called the sacramental, sacramentality of the everyday, the notion 
that the word of God by which we are nourished and the sacrament and worship experiences through which we celebrate our faith are not ends in themselves, but rather vehicles that sensitize us to seeing the manifestation of God's grace, the presence of the risen Christ in all dimensions of our everyday experience. I requested that Luke's account of the walk to Emmaus be the gospel lesson proclaimed this morning because I believe that this gospel account offers me an opportunity to both explore aspects of the Easter experience while also reflecting on the Eckerd College community and its role as a residential liberal arts college in covenant with the Presbyterian Church USA. For it is through my work at Eckerd during the past 34 years that often my eyes were opened and I recognized him. Eckerd College was founded as Florida Presbyterian College in 1958. Today, our college enrolls close to 2,000 baccalaureate level students from all 50 states and 39 countries studying 42 majors, the most popular of which are marine science, environmental studies, and animal studies. Our college has, through the years, cherished the free, open, and mutually enriching relationship we have had with the Presbyterian Church. But we are not an institution with a sizable number of students, faculty, and staff who identify with the Reformed tradition in general or the Presbyterian Church in particular. How then is our covenant with the church to be understood? The relationship between a college and a church partner all too often is conceived and expressed in polarities. You have at one end of the continuum colleges that regard their church affiliation as an historical artifact, part of the college's heritage, but not one that has very much impact on the day-to-day -day life of the college. At the other extreme, we are all familiar with colleges and universities affiliated with churches that assume a strong sectarian stance, so much so that the line between college and church becomes blurred. We at Eckerd reject both of these polarities and strive toward a much more nuanced notion of our church relationship. For us, the covenant relationship is more than just a quaint historical artifact from Eckerd's past. At the same time, we reject models of church-affiliated higher education that are sectarian and exclusive or that limit inappropriately the freedom and independence that should characterize every college and university. We often say at Eckerd that although it may seem counterintuitive, our church relationship, rather than limiting us, actually enhances our ability to be open to all faith and spiritual perspectives, to all students, faculty, and staff, irrespective of where they find themselves 
on their spiritual journey. In colleges and universities that do not have a church affiliation, spirituality, religion, and faith are often neglected as areas of focus in their academic and co-curricular programs. Not so at Eckerd, which values these key areas of human life and experience. Christian life is a journey, and we, like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, are faced every day with opportunities to recognize the risen Jesus, sometimes in the most unlikely places on our journey. As a small church-related residential liberal arts college, Eckerd's mission focuses not only on academic study, but also, and just as importantly, on the personal, social, ethical, and spiritual development of the students who study with us. It is a place where students are walking the road, so to speak, toward greater knowledge of themselves and the world, greater understanding of life's meaning, and a fuller appreciation of the goal of a life well lived, a life of meaning, a life of service to others. German theologian Karl Rahner wrote of the religiously unthematic dimension of human existence. He used the term unthematic in the sense of implicit or latent. Rahner affirmed that in all aspects of everyday life, there are sparks of transcendence, manifestations of God unthematically and implicitly present, often unrecognizable at first, yet real and powerful. Manifestations that beg for an opening of our eyes, that invite a dawn of recognition of God's presence. Eckerd College, in my experience, is a place imbued with the religiously unthematic the everyday sacramental. And whether students recognize this fact or not while they are with us, these manifestations have a powerfully formative impact on their lives and development. Prior to being named as president, I spent more than 20 years as vice president for student life and dean of students at the college. During those years, I walked the journey with many students. I saw how the transforming presence of the risen Christ could be manifested in an unthematic or implicit way as students navigated the inevitable joys, complexities, and challenges of development into adulthood. My colleagues and I have witnessed students embrace questions about life's meaning and their future career or vocational choices. We've had the joy of seeing young minds open up to new ideas and perspectives and discover new avenues of knowledge. We have walked with students as they struggled to refine their sense of self and to define more clearly who they are. As they redefined their relationships with their families and as they formed new relationships of love and friendship on campus. We have walked with students as they have dealt with the loss of a loved one, with substance issues, with fear and uncertainty, and with emotional and physical health challenges. Through these 
and many other similar experiences with students, my eyes were opened and I recognized him. In my own life of faith then, Eckerd College has been among the most important settings within which I have encountered the risen Christ, where I have experienced the sacramentality of the everyday, the unthematic yet profoundly powerful manifestation of God's grace and presence. It is often said that Eckerd College changes lives and Eckerd College graduates change the world. I have witnessed the transformative impact of the Eckerd experience on students' lives, including that of my own son, who is a 2014 graduate of the college, but also have experienced this transformative impact personally, and I am not alone. Scores of faculty and staff that I have known and with whom I have worked have been similarly transformed by their work at Eckerd and with Eckerd students. Allow me to pose once again the question that I raised earlier. What are the truly eye-opening experiences, people, activities, and events that yield a recognition of God's presence in your lives, that lead to your eyes being opened to the risen Jesus in our midst? Is there a recent, particularly powerful example in your life of such an eye-opening experience? How can we sensitize ourselves better prepare ourselves for such surprising epiphanies or manifestations of the risen Christ's presence in the everyday of our lives? How can our prayer lives, our reflection on sacred scripture, our works of mercy and justice better open us to the sparks of divine transcendence all around us at every moment? And when we are gripped by these moments, these epiphanies, will we say, like the two disciples, once their eyes and minds were opened, were not our hearts burning within us? In a commentary on Luke 24 in his sermons, St. Augustine wrote, quote, the Lord's absence is not an absence. Have faith, and the one you cannot see is with you. Dear friends, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And he is among us, sometimes appearing in the most unlikely persons, places, and situations. Have faith, and the one you cannot see is with you. Amen.
You may be seated. If you come back at the next service, we'll try to do that again and see how that works out. <laughs> Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, on this Lord's Day, which we are tempted to merely call the Sunday after Easter, we are grateful to pause and be reminded that this is, in fact, the Lord's Day, and that we call it the Lord's Day because it was the day that you claimed when you walked out of that tomb. That day became the Lord's Day, and not just that day, but every day became the Lord's Day. As historical as was that day when the tomb was left empty and you were roaming about, we rejoice to know and believe that the tomb remains empty and you continue to roam about. We speak not just of past, but of present. Today is just as much Easter Sunday as was that first Lord's Day when you called a Jewish peasant girl by name and appeared to travelers on the road and in the breaking of the bread. For you continue to walk beside us on the road and call us by name and joins us and join us at table so that we may follow you into the abundant life. We give you thanks, O God, that we live in kingdom times, that you, the King of Kings, has come to town, has conquered the evil one, and has defeated death, and is now establishing your reign in the world and in our lives. And we rejoice that the new sheriff is opening all the tombs and prison cells of our own making and setting us free to live in the liberty of grace and truth and spirit. We praise you that we have been released to be who we really are, the children of God, created to bring love and beauty into the world. And we rejoice that there is no more fear, no more judgment, no more shame, no more doubt, no more worry. For as much as you have claimed this day, so you have claimed us, and you will never let us go. Bearing our new identity and responding to your call, O oh God, we are bold enough to pray for the world this world you came to live for, die for, and live for again. This world you so love that you sent your only son. This world you are reconciling to yourself in Christ Jesus. And we are bold to pray for the world because we know that to pray for the world is to partner with you to love the world, to serve the world, to live for the world, yes, even to die for the world. We boldly pray that we might be the ones who feed the hungry and care for the sick, and befriend the lonely, and welcome the stranger, and bring justice to the victims, to announce, O oh God, the year of the Lord's favor. Put us, O oh Lord, on the front lines of your advancing kingdom, that we might see abundance in the abundance of others. For we pray all these things in the name of the risen Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The blessed apostle writes in this is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the worthy sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, he goes on to say, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. For no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. So friends, during this moment of gratitude, let us reflect on what our generosity might do to show our love for the world. You can give to Church of the Palms through all the various means that are outlined in the back of your bulletin and in the baskets as you leave the sanctuary. Let us continue our worship.
Let us pray. We give you thanks, O oh God, for opening our eyes to see our salvation in Jesus Christ and to see our blessings that we receive from you way beyond our imagination each day. Except these, our offerings and tithings we bring to you as a token of our love and gratitude to you. May they become your blessings of peace, justice, love around the world for all your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. time ago that Presbyterians stopped worshiping after an hour. <laughs> so we thought it best to just conclude with one verse of that wonderful hymn. And we invite you after the benediction and the benediction response to join us out in the courtyard for a little reception and for you to have the chance to meet Dr. Annarelli. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.